Good morning. Uh, my name is Peter Pang. I'm chairman and managing partner of IPO Pang uh, in Shanghai, uh, China. Today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about mergers and acquisitions, some specific uh, aspects of doing deals that are unique to China and to Chinese people. Um, but before I begin, I just want to share maybe 10 seconds of our background. Our firm has been in China uh, since the early 1990s. Uh, our firm has over 25 lawyers. Uh, we're focused on really four areas, foreign direct investment, um, employment law, intellectual property, corporate governance, uh, which includes uh, direct uh, foreign investments. Uh, we are a highly skilled, highly uh, experienced group of lawyers, and we love doing what we do, and that's why we're here. Uh, with respect to um, cross-border deals and situations that come up, uh, that would be of uh, interest. That would be a little different to other lawyers and other situations uh, in other jurisdictions. Uh, I'd like to cover really four, uh, four basic areas. The first one is, what does uh, negotiation making a deal really means in China? Uh, in China, there's an old saying, uh, you want to get somebody to say a yes to a deal. But a no means a possibly maybe. What you don't want is a hell no, I'm never going to see the guy again. And that's not uh, the end result that you want. But because in China, uh, most of us are fairly uh, reserved uh, in the way uh, of our demeanor and the way we express our, ourselves, uh, it is important uh, that um, uh, we focus on understanding the objective of the other party. Uh, it is often said, uh, if you want to have people that can speak Chinese, well, there are about 1.4 billion people that can do that and counting. But the art of the deal, shall we say, uh, is in uh, being able to communicate uh, your needs. And in China, it is particularly acute because of cultural differences uh, between the parties. And so uh, the language for business is numbers. We all know that. But the language for business in China is friendship, is trust, is developing a relationship uh, with the other party. And in China, uh, because historically the ability to uh, resolve conflict uh, in the courts, uh, it's hasn't been extremely uh, smooth. And so most Chinese culturally uh, approach doing a deal uh, in China is really based on looking at the other party across the table, look at them in the eye and say, does that make sense? Do I like the guy? Can I trust the guy? Will the guy be a partner with me through thick and thin? And so from that standpoint, it makes a big difference uh, in terms of what actually comes out of them. In the Western world, uh, more often than not, you can hate the guy. You don't like the guy, but yet you've got a contract. And as long as everything is in the contract, your 75 page, 150 page contract, then that's it. Then, then you can still do the deal and you don't have to go and uh, gambe, you know, drink and party and have dinner. But in China, it is exactly the, uh, the reverse. What is important uh, is that you form a bond, a, a friendship uh, with the party that's going to be your, your other side, your partner, uh, your distributor, uh, your joint venture partner, whatever it may be. And so it becomes important uh, for the uh, Chinese side to make a decision can I do business with this guy? And if I can do business with this guy, 
uh, does that make sense? You know, how can we um, work together in a way that's going to be a reduction of conflict, uh, a reduction of issues? And so when you look at uh, cross the uh, border transaction uh, with the Chinese, sometimes uh, we're accused of that. When do you start negotiation? Well, you do that after you sign the contract. Well, that does happen, but that happens only because the parties didn't have a very clear understanding at the very outset. So uh, doing business uh, in China, uh, negotiating with Chinese parties uh, often takes time. It takes time because of language. Uh, it takes time because of culture. It takes time because the parties are, it's almost like uh, what has been said about men and women. Men is from uh, Mars and women are from Venus. Sometimes you just sort of operate on different planets in different worlds. And so what is important is to get the parties together and be able to have a great discussion about the objectives, what you hope to gain from uh, the uh, the transaction uh, and what the uh, expectations are uh, of the parties. Now, uh, one of the big mistakes that I see foreign parties doing business with China and with Chinese people is that they fly into China uh, after perhaps some preliminary discussion or phone calls and then say, well, you know, I, I've got um, 10 days. I'm going to go back on Sunday, and so let's get down to it and let's do business. Well, the Chinese, first, that is uh, at odds with our culture. And then second, that's not the way uh, that the business is normally done. And third, knowing that you've got a deadline, let's not uh, talk turkey because we know your plane will leave in two hours. You're going to be agreeing to everything that we want. So you, you sort of approach the negotiation really from a, uh, a point of weakness. You never want to do that. Uh, and so what you want to consider is when you come and negotiate, never have your CEO come and negotiate. Because of the historical lack of proper venue for conflict resolution, uh, most uh, Chinese... Uh, uh, enterprises, small, medium enterprises, it could be uh, state-owned enterprises. They prefer having medium or underlings, to, shall we say, medium level managers and underlings do all the talking. And so uh, uh, oftentimes when there's a conflict, the American side will say, well, I'm the cowboy. I'm going to send my CEO. He's going to come down and he'll arm twist it. A little bit of the uh, Trumpism, shall we say, uh, that we see. That's exactly the wrong way to be doing a deal uh, with Chinese parties. What you need to do is to send your underlings in, have them uh, have a great uh, discussion, have them uh, negotiate and iron out all the details, and then take copious notes, and then come down with a list of five or seven major things that the parties uh, cannot uh, agree to, at least at the uh, mid-level, and then take those uh, back, back to the CEO, and then have the CEO come out and be the good guy. That's the good guy, bad guy. I think he comes in, he knows of the seven deals, he can give up three, uh, modify the other two or three, and then you can have a deal. To me, those are the fastest deals, and those are the things to keep in mind. And then when he comes out, make sure... Uh, in a conversation, he lets them know he has no ticket going back. He loves China, he loves Chinese food, and he's going to stay here forever. And so, uh, as they say about patience in China, he's going to outlast anybody on the China side. And that is the winning uh, formula. Uh, the other thing that is unique about doing business or writing contracts in China uh, is that more often than not, uh, you have a, um, a contract uh, that is written in English, which 
the parties need to decide uh, whether you negotiate in English or you negotiate in Chinese. But more often than not, there's a fundamental cultural difference, which sometimes you can lose the other side. And that is, I remember years ago, uh, I would negotiate uh, on behalf of a, a client from the U.S. And the U.S. company is a, a pretty large company. They have a 75-page document, which, of course, was a nightmare uh, to translate all of that. But they insist on having insurance, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, provisions in it. They insist on saying that uh, if we're going to uh, work together and in the event that things don't go well, we want to split that this was a joint venture, how will we split the assets and, and so on and so forth? Well, what happens is that that ended up offending the Chinese. Because when you're talking about marriage, you don't talk about divorce. That's bad luck. Uh, in the American uh, and perhaps the Western world, maybe it's not a big deal. You're about to get married, then let's talk about a prenuptial. What happens if you get a divorce? All you're going to get is $100,000. You know, I'm going to walk away. But for the Chinese side, it means lack of commitment, lack of interest, and lack of integrity. And I think uh, different cultures interpret it differently, and we certainly uh, need to uh, uh, keep that uh, in mind. The other quirk about doing business uh, and cutting deals, whether it be M&A deals, licensing deals, joint venture deals in China, uh, has to do with uh, the um, the Chinese uh, side, uh, because of the way the law is written, is that what is considered to be legally binding will be the chop. The chop is a stamp that you will stamp on every document. Normally it's read in Chinese, and then it indicates uh, the approval uh, of the document that the document has now has legal effect. Well, in the Western world, we always say, you're the uh, vice president of marketing. I'm the uh, CEO uh, of the U.S. company. Let's talk. And then at the end, we both have a signing ceremony and take pictures. Well, most of the signing ceremonies you see on the China side uh, with the Chinese party, they're all ceremonial because the real document, the document that's going to have binding and legal effect that will be a document that will be both signed by the legal representative as well as chopped uh, with the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the corporate seal, shall we say. Without it, uh, there are some arguments uh, that uh, the documents uh, will not have legal effect. And we have had instances where uh, the parties spent hours and days agreeing to it, then something happened, somebody came on with a better deal, and then the argument was made. It was never chopped, so therefore there was no legal effect. And so now we can go and um, uh, and 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 um, you know uh, uh, negotiate with another party. So that's an important aspect uh, of uh, dealing. Uh, another part that is worthwhile. Very few people uh, uh, do this, but um, but often you have to assess uh, the negotiating powers of the of both sides. Uh, if the Chinese side really wants to work with uh, you, or you want to really work with the Chinese side, uh, I think that the payment of a no shopping uh, clause, uh, which essentially says that for a period of 30 or 60 days, for a nominal fee, uh, that neither party uh, will be, um, you know, uh, uh, be negotiating with anybody else. Um, you know, that's something to consider. Uh, sometimes it's just one party paying to the other, uh, depending on the situation. If you know that the Chinese side is going to be entertaining somebody else, or you really want to deal with the Chinese side, it may be worthwhile uh, for you to have a no shopping clause. It has worked in the past, and it's something that's worth uh, considering. Uh, I, I, I want to tell you one story about a, um, a deal uh, uh, that, uh, that, that we had uh, cut uh, years ago, uh, which uh, uh, has a very uh, interesting result. Years ago, I represented uh, the, um, the inventor uh, of the third rail 
those of you that know about public transportation uh, or about electric trains, the third rail is the power carrying rail. Well, uh, we wanted to bring that technology uh, to China. Uh, and the, um, uh, the Chinese side was very interested. It was back in the days when China was just developing and China was very interested uh, in having new technology. But China was really in the early development stage. And in order to be able to uh, make the technology work, test it out, and actually uh, develop it uh, uh, as a, a business model in China, uh, the technologists with who I represented has to not only bring the technology, but he has to also bring with him uh, the money. Uh, and so oftentimes one will go to the Asian Development Bank, get some money, uh, or to the World Bank, and then be able to go from there. Well, uh, my client at that time uh, did not uh, have the money, uh, did not think it was important, and, and felt that uh, the Chinese uh, could figure out a way uh, to, uh, to fund the project. Uh, there had been stories about, you know, funding the third rail project, which is essentially a metro uh, project uh, with, um, you know, ticket receipts. To, but regardless, there has to be some investment by somebody of multi-million dollars. And so the mayor of that city came back to us after understanding what the client really wanted to do, had the technology but no money. He came back to us uh, and said, well, you know, what you're trying to do may be a little bit difficult. Uh, and of course, the American side, being a bit more of a cowboy, would say, no problem. I understand. Uh, we'll figure it out, but we want to move forward. Well, $5 million later, the project was still sitting there. Lots of traveling back and forth, lots of discussion, lots of going back and forth on technology and, and so on. But at the end of the day, uh, there was no money for the project and it just didn't go anywhere. And so the lesson that is learned is that whenever you're dealing with the Chinese party, uh, especially when you have a mayor of a city that tells you, you know, what you're trying to do may be a little bit difficult. What he actually means is go home, don't come back. It ain't going to happen. Forget it. You're wasting your time. So uh, saying no from the Chinese culture uh, standpoint uh, often is difficult, uh, often is not something that the, uh, uh, the Chinese the, uh, uh, find easy to say. Uh, and in fact, the joke is that the difficulty with China uh, is trying to get somebody to say yes, because no one's ever going to say a no to you. Uh, they just will never say a yes. And so you need to budget your time, budget your approach, and be in a position of coming in, working with the Chinese side, understanding the culture, be as efficient as you can. Otherwise, you're going to be spending $5 million and you still have nothing to show for it. So, you know, with that in mind, uh, I would uh, want to say, you know, uh, doing business in China, as we have done for the last, oh, 27 years or so, is a lot of fun. Uh, we, all of us, uh, Chinese people, are um, uh, uh, very hospitable. Uh, we often say, if you like Chinese food, uh, if you like China, come to us. We know all the best places to go and the best things to do. But the one thing to keep in mind is being friends, being comfortable, being uh, efficient at what you do is a different story in terms of being able to cut a deal. So don't come with an expectation that you're going to walk out with two suitcases full of money. Uh, come with the expectation that you're here for the long haul. Uh, we all like, uh, Chinese or otherwise, to hear of long-term uh, partnership. Uh, great friends, uh, uh, commitments, um, uh, a true partnership, a true working partnership. These are the things that are important to all of us uh, as Chinese business people, 
uh, as Chinese uh, uh, lawyers, uh, as Chinese uh, partners, working hand in hand uh, with all of you. So keep that in mind. Uh, China uh, is the next uh, frontier, the final frontier. It's the dragon and it's the big dragon. There's a lot of money to be made, but if you're gonna come into China, come into China with the idea of a firm commitment, with the idea that you will make it big because China is a society that turns on a dime, lots of uh, simulators and emulators, and that if you don't go big, you end up going home. And in most cases, you go home with your suitcase and your pockets empty. So be prepared, it's a great place to be. And I think all of your clients uh, will find China to be a fascinating and exciting place. I was at the IBA uh, recently, uh, and one of the um, uh, uh, very uh, interesting uh, persons spoke, and he had two clauses that I thought I would share with you uh, from the, um, and he was the former president of the International uh, Criminal Justice Court. He said, you know, respect China because of its fascinating past. Enjoy China because of its dynamic present. And believe in China because of its promising future. And that when you come to China, you want to and you should ask hard questions. You should listen generously and you should disagree respectfully. And with that in mind, thank you for your time.